Good evening, Impact DMV Church family, and I also want to say good evening to all the friends of our ministry. I'm so glad you're joining us once again for our midweek Impact Bible study. I am so glad you're here. As you know, as our routine is, put your hands on your tools. Go get your notepad, pen, paper, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, whatever you utilize to capture good notes. Go put your hands on that because I believe God's going to speak to you this evening and I want you to be able to capture whatever it is that the sovereign God of the universe will impress upon your heart. Well, we're back in the book of Romans today. We're in that fourth chapter still, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 15 today. And today we're going to talk about inheriting the world, inheriting the world. Let's look at that fourth chapter, verses 13 through 15. Let's read that, and then we'll actually get into our lesson for today. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For if it is the inheritance of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. One of the things that this or these verses teach is that there are either two possibilities for our future. These verses teach it, and actually the whole of Scripture teach this principle, that we would either inherit the earth or we will inherit wrath. Let's look at that 13th verse one more time, if you would. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith. Now, we know from verses 11 and 12 in this same chapter that the descendants of Abraham that have been mentioned here are not just the Jewish people, but he's speaking of those who have the faith of Abraham. And we see that explicitly in the book of Galatians. And I want you to become very familiar with this text. Go to Galatians, if you would, the third chapter, Galatians 3, and let's look at verses 7 through 9. It says, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Also, let's look at that 29th verse because this is key. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so the two possibilities, we either inherit the earth or we are under the law and therefore we are under wrath. Look at the 15th verse. It says, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. And so there are three lessons that I'm going to teach this week and next week. Uh, over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about inheriting the world. I want to slowly walk through this because I think this is important for us to know, as everything else is that I've been teaching through the book of Romans. So the first question that we're going to start answering today, or we will answer this question and part of the next question today is, how... And why will the law of God not help us secure the inheritance of the world? Again, how and why will the law of God not help us secure the inheritance of the world? Verses 14 and 15 are key in answering this question. It says, for if it is the inheritance of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. There are a couple of things we need to talk about in terms of what he's talking about as it relates to the law. He's not talking about the whole of the Old Testament. Neither is he talking about the law being the first books of Moses, the five first books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, whichever you would like to call it, because he is contrasting the law against the promise. And so the, the promise is actually found in the book of Genesis. So the promise would be found within the law. He's not contrasting law against law. He's contrasting the law against the promise. So the law here is something different than just being the whole of the old scripture or even the first five books of 
the Old Testament or the books of Moses. Instead of that, he's speaking of something that is a little more narrow. And we see this uh, more explicitly in the book of Galatians. If you go to Galatians, the third chapter and the 17th verse, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards. What Paul is saying here is that the law came 430 years after Abraham. So again, this is not talking about the Pentateuch. This is actually talking about the law. It says it does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. What the Apostle Paul has in mind here, again, it's not the first five books of the Bible, it's not the whole of the Old Testament, but he has the Mosaic law in mind, the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai hundreds of years after Abraham. Now, the Mosaic law was given on Mount Sinai and it contains promises and provision for forgiveness for those who break the law. Look at the Exodus 34 verses 6 through 7. I love this text because even in this text, when God gives the law to Moses, he's also speaking to Moses concerning his character. Look at what it says in verse 6 through 7 of Exodus 34. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. So we see here, even as God defines himself, his personhood, he's also communicating his provision for the forgiveness of sins for those who break the law. But he also says, but I will by no means clear the guilty. And who are the guilty? The guilty are the those uh, the guilty of those who are unrepentant, all right? But anyone who repents will receive forgiveness of sins. But those who are unwilling to repent, they will not be clear. They will remain guilty. And so let's look at this word commandment. Let's look at this word commandments. Go to the book of Romans, the seventh chapter. Um, I want you to pay attention to how the word commandment is used in Romans 7, verses 8 through uh, 13. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment or through the Mosaic law, produced in me all kinds of covetedness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment, when the Mosaic law came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment or the Mosaic law that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, the Mosaic law, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment, the Mosaic law might become sinful beyond measure. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul has in mind in our text for the day. Look at that 15th verse. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is the struggle that the Apostle Paul is talking about there in Romans 7. And I can't wait to get there because we will really delve into that more than I'm going to do today. But what does all of this mean? What he's saying is, is that within the law, there are certain kinds of behaviors. And if I am disobedient to those behaviors, it brings about wrath. Well, the problem is we're all disobedient. And that's the point of Romans 1.18 through Romans 3.20, that all of us are under the wrath of God. Why? Because all of us are disobedient. Why? Because we cannot keep the law. And therefore, 
when I try to secure my justification through the law, it only brings about death because I cannot keep the law. So I'm always going to be under the wrath of God. And that's what he means. For the law brings about wrath. We can't keep the law. We will always find ourselves being guilty. Well, there's a second part of that 15th verse, and it explains why this is. Look at it again. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So for 430 years between Abraham and the, the giving of the Mosaic law, there were all kinds of sinful attitudes and actions that went unnoticed for the most part. We look back upon them now and we have our judgment, but in that day, they, they didn't have a clear judgment. Why? Because there was no law. No specific commands were violated. But then the Mosaic law comes on the scene and the knowledge of sin explodes, right? So what was laying dormant, sin and the knowledge of sin, light was brought to specific violations and transgressions. Are you tracking with me? For an example, Prior to the giving of the Mosaic Law, you may have had a disrespectful child. We will look back upon it now and say that child was disrespectful. Now, the way they treated their parents, it may have gave them pause, right? Are you tracking with me? But there was no law that was violated. But then the law comes and you look at Exodus, the 20th chapter and the 12th verse. It says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Now that specific law is given, now when we see that behavior, we remember that law, we remember that standard, and now there is a consequence associated, there's wrath, a consequence associated with breaking that law. So let's read Romans 4 and 15 again. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. And now every single disrespectful word that comes from that disrespectful child, it is a specific violation against an explicit commandment. And so not only now is sin exposed, it increases. Are you tracking with me? Why? Because there is now a law and there's a propensity within humanity that once a law is given to violate that law and with every violation there's a consequence or there is wrath to be experienced. But thank God for the grace of God. Are you tracking with me? Look at Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 20 and 21. Thank God for this verse. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God for his grace. But what the Apostle Paul does, he does spell out for us in several locations the function of the law. Look at Romans 3 and 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. So the law will not bring about justification in his sight, in the sight of God, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let's look back at a text we've already reviewed today, Romans 7, 12 through 13 this time, and let's look for something different. Uh, let's go to the 12th verse. So the law is holy, circle that, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The 13th verse, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. And that is the point of Romans 4.15, that through the law, that dormant sin in our lives is exposed. But not only is it exposed, but it is stirred up and is made exceedingly more sinful. 
There's some things we have never even thought to do until we were told not to do it. Are you tracking with me? I remember, I may have shared this before. I remember one night my parents were going to Bible study at the church I was raised in. And I, for whatever reason, you could ask them, but they left us home that evening. And I remember on their way out the door, my father looks back to me and he says, do not watch Cooley High on television. Now, I had never heard of Cooley High, so therefore I wasn't even thinking about it. But when he told me not to watch it, there was something on the inside of me that stirred up and became exceedingly more sinful. And I just had to watch it. And I did watch it that night. I had not even thought about it. I wouldn't have thought about it if he hadn't have said it. And that's how it is for you and I. As we study the word of God and as we learn more about his character and his nature, trust me, sin is going to rise. But thank God for the God. And that is why you and I, we have to fight the good fight of faith. We have to fight the good fight of faith that he has taken the fifth of our lives and he has given us his righteousness by faith alone. And so there's another question that I must ask. How can we say that the promise of inheriting the world comes to us through the imputed righteousness of faith, even though the Bible teaches that active lived out righteousness is required to obtain the inheritance. Well, look at Romans 4 and 13. We're going to go back to that for a second to answer this question. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Remember the principle I taught you a couple of weeks ago about an alien righteousness. Uh, this is something that the reformers taught John Calvin as well as Martin Luther. They believe that we all have been saved by an application of an alien righteousness. And that alien, that word alien there simply means from another place. In other words, we do not save ourselves and we contribute absolutely nothing to our salvation. Absolutely nothing at all. So it is God who calls. It's the spirit who draws. He gives us faith to believe. He applies to us an alien right righteousness or righteousness from another place. And so this leads me to another principle. Um, so, so I'm challenging you here a little bit. It, our salvation, our soteriology, how we came into the knowledge of the holy to be believers or Christians, is it by monogism or is it by synergism? Is it by monogism or is it by synergism? And I will explain these two words to you. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about synergism because I don't believe in that. But I will spend a considerable amount of time this evening talking about monogism. Monogism means that this is a work of God, that God does this work alone. My salvation, my righteousness is by God's grace and God's grace alone. In other words, it's not my effort involved in it at all. Are you tracking with me? John Hendricks says this. Monogism is the view within Christian theology which holds that God works through the Holy Spirit to bring about the salvation of an individual through spiritual regeneration regardless of the individual's cooperation. In other words, God saves me and he didn't need my help in doing so. Are you tracking with me? There's a quote in the Westminster Confession of Faith. It says this, those of mankind that are predestinated unto life. God, before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, have chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his free grace and love alone without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto and all to the praise of his glorious grace. Article 8, title of Free Will of the Augsburg Confession reads this, 
Man's will has some liberty to choose civil righteousness and to work things subject to reason, but it has no power without the Holy Ghost to work the righteousness of God, that is spiritual righteousness. And the point that they are all making is that God alone saves. Can you repeat after me? God alone saves, that God alone saves. And the scriptures clearly define this from the Old Testament through the New Testament, that God alone saves. Look at Ephesians. I'm just going to go through a couple of New Testament passages today. Um, and, and when we get to Romans, the eighth chapter, I'll delve deeper into this. But for our subject today, just allow me just to give you a, a few references. Look at Ephesians, the first chapter, and let's look at verses four through five. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. The purpose of his will, not our will, but his will. Look at Romans 9 and 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Who can resist his will? Look at Romans 8 and 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The unregenerated mind cannot choose God. The unregenerated mind is hostile to the sovereign God of the universe and cannot submit to him, cannot submit to him, does not have the capacity to do so. The unregenerated heart is bankrupt. How are you tracking with me? Does not have ability. Look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter and the second verse. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the author and the finisher, the founder, the completer of our faith. We, he begins it and he ends it without our help at all. Now look at Philippians, the first chapter and the sixth verse. Philippians 1 and 6. And I am sure of this, and you ought to be praising God right now, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what God has begun in me, what Jesus has begun in me, I can rejoice in the reality that he will bring it to completion. I won't bring it to completion but he will bring it to completion and all the glory goes to him alone. I can take none of the glory. If I help God out in my salvation and some of that glory belongs to me, but since I had nothing to do with it, mm, praise God, since I had nothing to do with it, all the glory goes to him. Look at the book of Ephesians. Go to Ephesians, the second chapter, and let's look at verses 8 and nine Ephesians 2 8 and 9 it says for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God if I work for it it is no longer a gift if I help in giving it to myself it's no longer a gift from God not a result of works so that no one may boast I have no boast in my salvation my boast is in the Lord. Why? Because my salvation has been initiated and completed by the sovereign God of the universe. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. There is a biblical order that is regeneration happens before faith. Regeneration precedes faith. Look at John 6 and 63 and actually the book of John would be a magnificent book to read to really understand this principle. John 6:63 6, says this, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Circle that. The flesh is no help at all. Not a little bit of help. No help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Look at the 65th 
verse in that same chapter. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the father. No one can come to Jesus unless it is granted to him by the Father. We don't wake up one morning and decide we're going to be saved. No, it has been granted to us. We have been regenerated by the sovereign God of the universe. A grace gift has happened in our souls. And that's why we pursue him. Why? Because he wooed us first. Are you tracking with me? Look at John 6 and 36. Back up a little bit. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. There are those who see Jesus every single day and they do not believe in him. And the reason why they do not believe in him is for all the reasons I've already spoken because they have not been quickened and made alive to him by the Father. They have not been drawn by the Father. Regeneration has not happened. And so what should our prayer life be? Our prayer life should be for regeneration of our loved ones, that God would open up their eyes so they can see the gospel. Are you trying? tracking with me. Well, there's an order of salvation again. When I get to that eighth chapter of the book of Romans, I will spend some time here and explain it. But for the most part, I just need to make our point for today. Romans 8, 29 through 30 gives to us or gives us rather the order of salvation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so we learn the order of salvation from these verses. And let me give them to you. Uh, I'll put them on the screen as well. And I am a sovereign grace guy. I believe in monetarism. I believe that we've been saved by the grace of God with no effort from my part at all being involved. And I just showed you from the scriptures where the Bible validates my view. First, there's election. God chooses by grace. Then atonement. God purchases in Christ. Then there is the inward call. God calls through the gospel. Then regeneration happens. God makes us alive. Then there is conversion. God gives us faith. And we see that in John 1, 12 through 13. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but by God. So God enables us or enables man to repent and he believes. Then there's justification. God declares man righteous. Then there's adoption. God makes man as a child. Then sanctification. God purifies man and then man obeys. Then there's perseverance. God preserves man and man endures. And then there's glorification. God consummates salvation. So from all of this, you can see that I believe and I pray that this is the stance of Impact DMV and all that are listening to me so that we can worship God. Worship explodes when we understand that salvation truly is of the Lord, that he is still making his sovereign selections a day. And I'm so glad that God has chosen you and he's chosen me. So monitorism is the proper description or descriptive for the process of salvation. It is of the Lord and of the Lord alone. The other word that I gave you versus monetarism is synergism. And that is uh, in summary that we collaborate with God in terms of bringing about our salvation. There's a quote here that I want to share with you by Donald G. Bloch, and he gives a good definition, I believe, for what synergism is. In Christian theology, synergism is the position of those who hold that salvation involves some form of cooperation between divine grace and human effort. 
And I guess from everything that I've said thus far, you know that I am not in that camp. Uh, you track with me. So I believe that Paul, in our lesson today, where he's talking about the righteousness of faith, he's talking about an imputed righteousness that we have received from the sovereign God of the universe. And it has been laid to our, our account by faith alone in Christ alone. And none of that has happened without the, the, the grace of the sovereign God of the universe working in my life and in your life. And so then there's a question that must be answered. How are we to understand the many texts in the Bible that make our future inheritance of eternal life in some sense dependent on our behavior in this life? And we're going to pick that up next week. We're going to continue this next week. But I pray that you've heard all that I've said today and you'll go back and read the text and study and spend some time with this and even wrestle with this because I think many of you already understand the massive implications of all that I've said thus far. And when we get to the eighth chapter, and that's how it's kind of how Paul works in the book of Romans. He drops a seed earlier, but he does not give a, the full explanation of what he's saying until later on in the book. So the deeper truths to what I've shared tonight will be shared in chapters 8 and 9 of the book of Romans. But we'll pick this up next week. So make sure you are here next week. Bow your heads if you would. Father, I thank you, Father. I thank you. I thank you, Father God. I thank you for the inheritance that we have received in Christ because we have Abraham's faith, Father. And because you have given us, Father, the ability to put our hope and our trust and our faith in you by regenerating our souls, Father, along with that comes a reward of inheriting the earth, Father. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that we glory in you and that you birth in us, Lord, that gratitude impulse that we talked about many, many months ago. And as we understand the gospel, that gratitude, the overwhelming gratitude for you you saving our souls. Millions didn't, millions didn't make it, Father, but we have made it, and I'm so grateful and thankful to you. Bless us and keep us, Father, till we come together again, Lord. And Lord, may your grace be with us as we wrestle through the text for a deeper understanding of your gospel. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.